So welcome everybody for this new seminar at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía in Granada, in Spain. And today we will have the talk to be black or not, given by Dr. Beatriz Bonga. And she will be properly introduced by our director, Anchon Alberdi. So please, Anchon. Okay. Good morning to everybody. And welcome to our Severo Ochoa seminar program. And our speakers today is Beatriz Bonja. Okay, she's a theoretical physicist with a strong background in general relativity. Her current research focuses on foundational questions in general relativity and predictions also for future gravitational wave observatories such as the Einstein Observatory and LISA. Currently, she works as assistant professor at the Radboud University in the Netherlands and Previously, she has been working at the Permitter Institute in Canada, uh, Permitter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Canada, and at the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania State University, where she, she made her PhD on gravitational radiation with a positive cosmological constant under the supervision of Professor Astekar. She's author of some uh, 30 papers published in peer review magazines. And in addition to that, and since the year 2015, she has presented 42 invited seminars and four colloquia, and she has given 38 presentations at conference and workshop. And what is remarkable is that 22 of them were invited. As for teaching experience, she has been lecturer at the Radboud University since the year 2021, and she has been also guest lecturer at the institutions where she was working previously at the Perimeter Institute and also at the Pennsylvania State University. Moreover, she has supervised 15 master students, and she's currently also supervising two PhD students. Dr. Bonja is strongly committed with outreach and diversity, and for that reason, she usually gives talks and writes articles and participates in outreach events. About her research, let me mention that she is interested, among others, in the gravitational wave theory, resonance effects in neutron stars and black hole space times, and gravitational radiation in cosmological space times. Today, she will give a colloquium that in principle was supposed to be to be black or not, but at the end, I see that the title is a little bit more complete. <laughs> Can we distinguish black holes from other compact objects? I am sure it will be very interesting. Thanks a lot, Beatrice. Welcome to our institute, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I don't need this. Good. Wow, that's a, a spectacular introduction. I don't think I've ever been introduced like that. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I realized my title to be black or not makes sense if you just talk about or think about black holes all the time like me, but if you're maybe not thinking about black holes all the time, it could maybe have come across as offensive to some, so I hope it didn't. If so, I apologize um, for that. Yeah, so hence the new title. Uh, this is what I had in mind. Can we distinguish black holes from other compact objects? And as I said, I am uh wait no i think this needs to be removed <laughs> yeah now good i am uh, very happy to be here in this beautiful town and also at this very fun uh uh workshop on um QFTs on curved space times, which uh, I hope you enjoyed the previous talk by Patricia on exactly entanglement in finite regions, which is also a big interest of mine. Um, Patricia really got me into the subject, but today in this, this talk, uh, I'll talk more about my other main interest, which is general relativity. And in particular, I'm gonna focus on black holes and gravitational waves. So you may, or you probably know, uh, <laughs> all of you, even if you just work on quantum field theory on curved space time, we have lots of gravitational wave observations. We have about 100 events seen already. And as of yesterday, LIGO is taking new observations again. So soon there will be, in fact, many more. This is very exciting because this provides us with a wealth of information, right? We can learn, you know, interesting astrophysical things like what is the distribution of black holes and their masses in our universe? Um, we have now an independent way to go and measure the Hubble constant, which is particularly nice given uh, this, this Hubble tension. Um, 
and from more like the theory side, it's very interesting that we have another way of testing general relativity in in a new strong field regime, a dynamical strong field regime, and we can test the nature of black holes. And all these things, they're gonna get you know, better and better with you know, more observations and with better detectors. And of course, you know, since I'm based in the Netherlands, I want to show this beautiful picture of the Einstein telescope, um, which hopefully will be built in the Netherlands, but maybe in, uh, elsewhere, but in any case. So, uh, and Lisa, right, both very cool new gravitational wave Observatory, so things are really, you know, going somewhere. Um, and in particular, in this talk, uh, I am going to focus on testing the nature of black holes. Now, you may ask yourself the question, why would you test the nature of black holes, right? Like, are black holes a pretty established thing in physics? Which, yeah, you know, I think nowadays they are, right? But the first people that discovered black holes, they really thought that black holes are weird. And in all honesty, I quite sympathize with them, right? Black holes are weird, right? Like, I mean, they're beautiful, nice analytic solutions to uh, Einstein's equations, but you could have like sort of said like, well, you know, they're somehow too idealized, too simple. Um, they might be nice mathematical solutions, but they don't necessarily have anything to do with physics. And you could also give some arguments, right? Because these are the only macroscopic objects that we know of that you can just describe with two parameters, right? Their mass and their spin. That's pretty weird. Like if you want to describe me, two numbers is not gonna do it, right? Like you can try, of course, but it, I'm pretty sure you can then interchange me with Gerardo and, and like, we'll be fine, right? You need more than two numbers. Black holes are even much bigger and, and we just need two. So I think that is remarkable. Uh, they're vacuum solutions which is also weird, right? Because typically when we think of stars, we think of like matter, right? Like stuff there. But black holes are, well, you know, like stars, except that they're vacuum solutions, which is strange. And connected to that, right? Because there's no matter that, that makes them, right? If, in Einstein's equations, if we just look at the relevant um, fundamental constants, right? We just have G and C. And in, there's no like matter length scale or anything, right? We just have G and C, which also means, right, that if, at least in four dimensions, with G and C, you cannot create a length scale. And as a result of that, that mass parameter in your, uh, say, Schwarzschild solution is really, truly a free parameter. Means can take on any values. This is also the reason why we seem to have black holes on all scales, right? We have stellar mass black holes and, like, supermassive black holes that are millions or even billions uh, times more massive than the mass of our sun. Like we don't have any other like star-like objects or things like that that really span this massive range of skills. Good. So, you know, I think black holes are weird. So it seems reasonable to go and really test whether they're up there uh, in our universe. It's okay. Um, how do we do that? Well, the astrophysicists uh, uh, in, in this room and elsewhere do that by essentially testing this thing that there is a lot of mass in a small region. So how do they do that? Well, you know, for instance, um, if we look at the center of our own galaxy, we can see a bunch of stars. And based on the orbit of these stars, we have to conclude that there has to be a lot of mass. And it has to be, of course, within the, re the, the, the smallest orbit of one of the stars. And then you say, well, you know, then it might as well all be within the Schwarzschild radius, and hence there is a black hole. But of course, this is not a very uh, good test of really it being there. Uh, being a black hole it just tells us that there's a lot of mass in a somewhat small region, but doesn't quite test whether this is a black hole. Similarly, for tidal disruption events where black hole like objects eat stars, um, we can learn a lot of things. It's plausible that they're black holes, but we're not quite really testing things like is there a horizon, etc. Uh, I think one of the best evidence uh, for the existence of black holes are these recent um, uh, pictures by the e, uh, Event Horizon Telescope that measure the X-ray emission from accretion disks. But also in that case, you know, I mean, they're beautiful results, uh, let me <laughs> be honest. Uh, but even in that case, really to interpret the data, there's a lot of astrophysics uh, that goes into the interpretation. So it's not that clear cut. This is all in the electromagnetic spectrum. Then as of you know, 2015, we now also have gravitational waves, which allow us to 
um, have a new way of trying to test the nature of black holes. And that is what I'm going to focus on in this talk. Now, how to test the nature of black holes? I think there's sort of two key tests that you can do, right? You can do consistency checks where you say, okay, I'm going to do multiple measurements of this object in the sky and I'm going to make sure that all the properties that I see of this object are consistent with it being a black hole. Or I do, I look, look at my data and I say, okay, is this data, you know, can I describe it with a black hole and with some alternative model and which of the two does better? So if the first uh, set of uh, consistency checks, we have black hole spectroscopy, there's uh, multiple moment tests, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, I'll get to these later. And then for the alternative models, you can compare different types of models, right? So we have standard other compact objects like neutron stars. So you can ask yourself the question, is this, you know, the gravitational waves coming from this object? Can I also describe it with, say, a neutron star instead of a black hole? Or you could have, say, a black hole in some modified theory of gravity, right? Say, say, quadratic gravity and see if it fits the data. Or you can have, you know, standard GR, but, you know, somewhat exotic or atypical new matter, you know, not like a neutron star or something like that, and see if those objects that you can create that look like black holes fit the data well. And in the rest of this talk, I am going to first talk about this, these new matter models and can new uh, atypical model models and, and, and uh, contrast them with, with black holes. Then in the second part, I'll talk a little bit about black hole spectroscopy. And in the last part, I'll talk about this. So the good news, if you're a quantum field theorist and you got lost in any of these parts, uh, most likely you will be able to catch up in the new part because it will be all new. So uh, don't worry, not all of your hour will be wasted. Uh, in any case, so the first part, right? So these new matter models or typically these things go by the name of exotic compact objects or black hole mimickers. And we have essentially two sort of rough categories. So we have black hole objects or mimickers that have smooth distributions and those that have a very clear cut, well-defined boundary. Now the smooth distributions are um, such that there's no horizon but they're quite nice in the sense that their formation scenario is very well understood. So we can, for these kind of objects, really can simulate them on the computer, right? We don't have the object. We put some initial conditions with say some scalar fields, things like that. We let it evolve. We see these objects form, right? Like we really understand sort of how in principle in nature they could form. Uh, and examples are, for instance, boson stars. So just to give you an idea, right? This would be say some scalar field that has some density profile and you know, in principle, that density profile it has some some tails. So, you know, in principle, it goes all the way. It's non-zero all the way up until infinity. Hence, you know, the fact that they don't really have a boundary. So, typically, you know, of course, if we talk about these objects, we say they have a radius, but by their radius is simply defined as you know, say, ninety-five percent of the mass is within this region, and that's the radius. But in principle, they, they extend all the way to infinity. Um, but you know, these are. As I said, like their formation scenarios is nicely understood. It might be plausible, right? Like we have scalar fields in our universe, so it's maybe not crazy that we have objects like this. And the other class with a boundary is typically the situation where we sort of glue two space-time regions. So we say, well, you know, these should be black hole mimickers after all. So you know, let's think about the non-rotating case. So on the outside, it should be like Schwarzschild. So let's just pick the Schwarzschild space-time. And then on the inside, you know, I don't like it that it's a vacuum solution, so I put stuff in there, say. And then, of course, right, you cannot, or you can always glue solutions in uh, the Einstein field equations. This just the, 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 the price you have to pay is that you get a membrane at the intersection. Um, and, that, and that's indeed what you have here. And the thing, of course, it's, you know, the nice thing about this construction is quite easy to write down theoretically. The only part is that their formations or the formation scenario of these things is, is very poorly understood. It's, it's strange to somehow create these kind of objects. Um, and examples are firewalls, uh, certain wormhole models, um, and grava stars and anti desitter bubbles. So, then one key that all of these black hole mimickers should do is that right, they should mimic or they should at least 
satisfy this astrophysical definition, so to say, of lots of mass in a small region, right? Because we have quite some tests about that. So that lots of mass in a small region, we can quantify by their compactness. So we look at the mass over its radius. And for a non-rotating black hole, that number is a half. For the next most compact object in our universe that we know of, we're, we're quite certain that's, that are there, neutron stars, and they you know, can have compactness up to about 0.2. The next object right, is already you know, 1,000 times less compact than a black hole. Those are white dwarfs. And then get just you know, for reference, say if we look at the, our sun, you know, it's, it's very small. Compared, it's not that compact at all. Good. So of these black hole mimickers, these smooth distributions, they, their compactness, you know, of course you have a bunch of free parameters that you can work with. Right? If you have a scalar field, you can introduce some self interactions, whatever. So you can, you have quite some wiggle room to play with. But even, you know, whatever you do, it turns out that it's almost impossible to go beyond this compactness of 0.3. So you don't really get that close to an, that half of a non-rotating black hole. These space times with a boundary, uh, you can essentially make them as compact as you like, right? Uh, well, of course, not less than a half because then you would collapse to a black hole, but you can make them pretty much to one half plus epsilon. Yes. Uh, uh, there is no theorem that will show you that, but there's lots of like uh, theoretical constructions and people have really sort of been fine tuning and things like that. And, and, and they don't find any um, configuration higher than this. So there's not a theorem, but you know, uh, whatever you try to do, like all the natural or most plausible things have already been tried. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Yeah, more, please. great. Yes, please. By the way, I didn't say that, but questions are always welcome. Could, could you wait, please, so that... Oh, but yeah, please microphone. wait for the microphone. <laughs> uh, so what's the difference between the uh, width boundary black hole mimickers and black hole? Uh, do you mean just, uh, is there a singularity or not? So yeah, and, and none of these, well, it, typically none of these things have a singularity, right? These, these smooth distributions don't even have a horizon, but, you know, from an observational standpoint, right? On the outside, they, they, they look quite like black holes, but you know, they're not, right? Either because indeed they don't have a singularity, they don't have a horizon, mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. Okay, so with the, the width boundary could have exact compactness uh, as black hole, it's just without singularity. Correct, yes. Like questions, right? Thank you so much for taking questions. So, so how, I, it's following up on this, right? What, what do you call a black hole versus a black hole mimickers? For example, you have a trapped surface for a long, long time. I would call it black hole still. So is the singularity what you would call black hole or not? Uh, yes. okay. Or singularity? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for the purpose of this talk, I'll be very conservative and, well, uh, call anything that is like Schwarzschild or, or Kerr, I should say, for a long time, that I'll, I'll consider a black hole. So, that is, yeah, I, I would, yes. Yeah. Maybe we can reserve the technical talks to the end if that's okay. So. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Sorry. Thank you. Very technical questions, maybe you can say, but um, good. So, for the rest of this 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 first part, I'll focus on on this class of space times with these boundaries, just because you know their compactness can be really like a black hole. So it's they're kind of an interesting class, I would say. So as I said, right, the examples are gravistars and certain wormhole models. Uh, this is an artistic picture of a gravistar, but for the people that don't know what it is, uh, essentially what you have on the inside is dark energy, or if you want, a sitter universe. Uh, and then on the, the outside, uh, it's just sword shield, and then you have a membrane uh, across it. Now, before, of course, you go and do lots of like, spend a lot of uh, computational energy uh, and, and, and data analysis time and hours on um, actually comparing your data with these models, of course you should do uh, some theoretical tests, I would say, like make sure that these objects that you're looking at are in fact actually stable. Because if they're not stable, right, they might not even be there in our universe, so what's the point? So that's what we did. 
So we looked at perturbations of these kind of objects in the small wavelength limit. So we, right, we introduced some radial perturbation for these objects, right? And we asked ourselves the question, okay, what is gonna happen with this perturbation? Is it going to, to grow or it's going to decay? So let's zoom in. So if we zoom in, right, we can say, well, we're looking at the small wavelength limit anyhow, so we can just consider it to be flat. And we look at these, these radial perturbations. So that means just perturbations in the Z direction, so to say. And we did our analysis for the case where you just have an interior vacuum. So this, this does include things with a cosmological constant or not. So it could be indeed like a gravistar. And on the outside, we have the short shield exterior. <laughs> and our analysis, what we decided to do is just, we, we did this in full nonlinear, uh, or well, full linear general relativity, or we linearized uh, this, but uh, we did this, of course, in general relativity and asked ourselves the question, what's going to happen with these perturbations? Um, since those calculations look kind of ugly, I decided to present you the Newtonian case, just because it is, the whole principle is completely, you know, one-to-one, -one. you can map. The both cases, but you know you can upgrade my Newtonian analysis to the GR case. I just want you to know that. Good. So let's look at the Newtonian case. So instead of working with uh, Einstein's equations and uh, the conservation of your stress energy tensor, you now work with the continuity equation, the momentum equation, and the Poisson equation. And then putting those together, you find this particular formula. What is this formula? Well, this formula tells us how this perturbation will change in time depending on the perturbations of your uh, potential, your gravitational potential, and uh, the disk forces, so to say. So in particular, right here, we have our gravitational potential, uh, which just satisfies, you know, um, this uh, Laplace equation with this boundary condition, right? This sigma is uh, the surface energy density of my membrane. And um, we have some disk forces. And these disk forces come essentially from the fact that, well, you work with a membrane which has some internal energy density and pressure. So that naturally wants to do stuff, so to say, to the, these perturbations. And let's see what it will want to do, right? Will it want to make the, the perturbation grow or, or does the gravitational force, will the gravitational force dampen this perturbation? Good, now I am, as I said, right, I'm only interested in perturbations that are orthogonal to the membrane. So these lines with the, um, what's it? Okay, the, the, the vertical lines, right? These are derivatives along the horizontal direction. So we don't need to consider those, right? We're just gonna look at stuff in the Z direction. So we can ignore this term. And now we need to look at the disk in force where also, again, we can ignore this term and the disk out force where uh, we have all these terms. Now, these terms, right, uh, if you're very good at Newtonian physics, they probably, you see them very nicely. I am no longer good at Newtonian physics because it's been a long time. So actually, I derived this starting from GR and take the Newtonian limits, uh, which <laughs> is pretty terrible. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, once upon a time, I was in a class and once said like, yeah, yeah, if you don't know the, the classical result, just, you know, do the quantum calculation, take the limit h bar to zero. And I was just laughing. I thought, what an idiot. And now, you know, many years later, I sort of find myself doing the same thing, but uh, <laughs> in the GR sector. In any case, um, these are these disk forces. So, and the question now is, right, like what happens in this iconal limit, the small wavelength limit, right? Or in other words, the large K limit. So we need to expand our perturbations in, you know, this e to the power i kx. And we're interested in what happens to these forces when K is um, large. So we'll find, in fact, that this term, it doesn't scale with K, okay, right? And this term scales linearly, or sorry, quadratically with K. <laughs> and the gravitational force is just linear with K. So as you can see, right, in the small wavelength limit, this term is going to dominate the disk out force. And well, not surprisingly, in this picture, also the disk out force is the larger force. So as a result, right, you will see that this perturbation will want to grow. In other words, this thing is unstable. Of course, this does depend on the sign of your uh, energy density and pressure. So in particular, right, you can also look at the time scale in which this 
this perturbation will grow, right, which is determined by this frequency. And whenever right, the frequency is negative, you have an instability. So whenever the pressure and your energy density of the um, surface have the same sign, uh, your system is unstable. So in particular, if we look at, say, the, you know, as an example, the Gravistar parameter space, you see that this entire region here is completely ruled out already just from theoretical you know, considerations. So I think that's quite nice, um, which made me happy. So I, it made me realize, oh, maybe I don't need to invest a lot more time in these, in these models. And I can just uh, start with other, or investigate other interesting models. In particular, uh, you know, I wanted to mention this. I think this is kind of nice for people that know about tidal love numbers. If you don't know about this, you can forget this comment. But tidal love numbers essentially tell you um, something about how easy it is to deform an object. And in particular, it turns out black holes are very rigid. So they're very hard to deform. And it means that their black hole or their tidal love numbers are zero. Um, but typically, a tidal love number is positive. But here in this case, right, we've learned that these objects right are in, unstable so if i have a small perturbation we'll want to grow in other words it means right that these objects somehow prefer to be less spherical which means that if i look at the gravitational potential of these objects you can you know look at all the different terms but for instance right you'll have a quadruple moment squared times you know uh, one over two uh lambda where lambda is this um tidal love number and it tells me, right, you typically want to minimize your gravitational potential. So since I want to be less spherical, right, I want to increase Q, that means that my lambda will have to be negative. So this instability is really linked with this, this these neg negative uh, love numbers. Yes? Correct. The P is the P of the membrane. But isn't it natural that uh, the pressure of the membrane would be negative, right? That's... So again, in many of these, some of these models, that's taken as the, the, the typical thing to do, but in some of these other models, it's not. Okay, so, um, but it's not impossible, yeah. right? No, it's not impossible, no, 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 true. So, you know, some part of the parameter space, these models are still totally fine, that's if, right. Can we leave the technical questions for the end, please, so that uh, everything is further? Good. Sorry. So this, um, so, Yes, so these models, well, at least for me, I'm, I'm quite happy to discover that um, they're unstable and that's this nice link between this negativity of the love number. So it, just also a takeaway message, if you ever see negative love numbers, probably these objects are unstable. Uh -oh. Good, so moving on to the second part. So uh, if you got lost, you can wake up again. Uh, and. This has to do with the three stages of the waveform. So you probably have seen this, but in case you haven't, right? Typically, when we look at the in-spiral of two objects, we divide or, you know, we get a waveform and we divide that waveform in three regimes. So we say there's an in-spiral regime where the two objects are relatively far. And in that regime, we can use post-Newtonian theory to describe the waveform. Then we have a ring-down regime, which sort of happens after the two black holes have merged and become one. And in that regime, you typically get something uh, that we call quasi-normal modes. So these are like the normal modes of, of typical objects, but quasi because they decay, right? This is, the signal goes down. So these are called quasi-normal object uh, modes. And this regime, we can describe with black hole perturbation theory, because we say, well, it's one black hole, right? And it rings down. So we, we might as well be able to use black hole perturbation theory. And then in the middle, we don't really have any good analytic tools. So there we use numerical relativity. And that's the regime that we call merger. Now, black hole spectroscopy that I mentioned before is done exactly in this regime, this ring down regime. Now, this ring down regime is quite interesting, right? Because in that regime, what we do is right, we really say, OK, two black holes have merged into one new one. So we have one black hole. So we can use, like I said, black hole perturbation theory, which means that you know you take your black hole is a background and you do linear perturbations on it. Then of course the question is, okay, like when is linear perturbation theory valid? Can I, you know, when does that start? Is uh, that whenever, you know, my waveform has a peak, can I use it then? Or another quantity, say psi four, one of, uh, if you're a numerical relativist, that, that means something to you. Or maybe should I, 
wait until there's a common apparent horizon so that I really talk about one black hole uh, instead of like these two disconnected black holes. Uh, or should I wait, say some 10 M, uh, this is uh, a time unit if you're a relativist, um, or 20 M or like, when can I really use linear perturbation theory? And in principle, like for a long time, people thought, well, obviously, you know, you should not start doing this at the peak because that is still in this merger regime, right? Like the two black holes, they've just formed maybe one common apparent horizon, but that horizon is nothing like the horizon of, you know, say a Schwarzschild curve black hole, right? It's like, if you look at different simulations, it's very like peanut shaped and weird because, you know, there are two black holes making up this object. So clearly you should not trust linear perturbation theory at that stage yet. Until actually quite recently, some other people argue, well, actually, no, 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 somehow miraculously, we don't know why, but you should, you can already use linear perturbation theory at the peak. So what did they do to make that very strong claim? They did the following. They looked at some numerical simulations of black holes merging, and they started to fit these things. Um, and what did they fit, right? So in this, this, this uh, plot here, you see, you know, the time from the peak, and here we see something that is called the mismatch. So this mismatch is essentially you want it to be as low as possible because that means that you have um, managed to fit the data very well. So the lower it is, the better. And in the data, in this case, the data, right, is that numerical simulation. So what did we fit it with? Well, we fit it with these quasi-normal modes that we obtained from linear perturbation theory. And in this case, they said, okay, well, we should first fit with the fundamental mode, right? The, and then, you know, if you do that, if you fit the data with a fundamental mode, you see that indeed, like before the peak, you do very poorly, right? Your mismatch is 100%. Uh, but if you go a little bit after the peak, it, it goes down quite rapidly and, you know, quickly, you do quite well, you know, in, in order to describe the data. But they noticed something interesting. They said, well, if you don't just include the fundamental mode, but also some higher overtones, then you, you can even, you know, at the peak, uh, have a mismatch that is, you know, essentially you know, pretty much as low as your numerical noise. Right? So in particular, if you include seven overtones, you do fantastically. So it did somehow seem to suggest that linear perturbation theory does, you know, really well already in a regime where, you know, it, it should be very strong, you know, nothing should be more strong field gravity, I would say, than, you know, the collision of two black holes, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this was a very surprising result. And in fact, it was even got more surprising, I would say, because people read it, this analysis, not just with these gravitation waves far away at infinity, but they did this also at the horizon. And they found the same things. So in this plot, you see essentially the same thing, right? This is from the time of the peak. And you see that, okay, if you have used just one overtone, you don't do very well. But if you include multiple overtones, you do um, incredibly well in, in, in matching your data. So this was even more surprising, right? Because this horizon, as I said, is in the strong field regime. So, you know, these results were very strange. Uh, luckily, there was actually a somewhat, well, maybe obvious conclusion in hindsight, uh, but that's how it always goes, right? Whenever I fit this data with these quasi-normal modes, right, what I do, right, I say, okay, my waveform, which I denote by this H, I can fit with this model, right, where I have some well, one over R term, not so important, I have my amplitude, and then my exponentials with my uh, gravitational, uh, or these uh, frequencies, the quasi-normal modes, uh, some phase, and these amplitudes. And by construction, right, all the time dependence is up here, right, in the exponential. So that means, right, these amplitudes are constant. But if you actually look at the fits that people did, right, to the data, you see that these amplitudes are not constant at all. In particular, right, if you look at the fundamental mode, right, then indeed that its amplitude is constant. But if you already look at the amplitude of the first overtone, you see that it varies 
almost by uh, or yeah almost by an order of magnitude and you know the, the higher you go say to the third overtone you see that you vary like more than six orders of magnitude so the conclusion was okay well maybe you know you thought linear perturbation theory did wonderful but in fact what you did is just overfitting so there was nothing fundamental right it's you know gr is still a proper non-linear theory luckily and Linear theory is, you know, sometimes great, but not all the way until this, this very dynamical regime. So the nice thing is, in fact, that what people then did, they said, okay, well, actually, can we maybe do better then? Because it was, you know, from a, at least from a data science perspective, it was kind of nice if we could fit more tones, we can do better black hole spectroscopy, right? Because the more tones you have, sort of like the more measurements, of your black hole and the more consistency checks you can do. So what people then did, they said, okay, well, uh, we're going to do the same sort of exercise. We're going to go fit the data with multiple overtones, but not crazy many like seven, because clearly then, you know, you're overfitting, but let's do something slightly more agnostic. So in this case, uh, what they did is they fitted the data with the fundamental tone, one overtone, and then they said, okay, we'll let the data choose where you know what the best next frequency is and that's what you see here in this plot so in this plot you see the frequency which um on this axis you see the real part in there the imaginary part of course these frequencies are right have an imaginary part because they're quasi-normal mode so you need a decay therefore we have an imaginary component and here we see this mismatch right and as you remember right we want the mismatch to be as low as possible so what it seems to suggest, right, the data really likes to have a frequency that's in this, this area. And if you look in this area, you see that that frequency corresponds exactly to the prediction you would get from not using linear perturbation theory, uh, but um, going to the next order in perturbation theory. So from quadratic perturbation theory, so to say. And in particular, right, uh, this would, would have been the next overtone and that's up there so that really tells us that in fact you know luckily gr still is a, a nonlinear theory and even if you you want to go and look for extra overtones you need to include at least or need to go to to uh, higher order perturbation theory so there are nonlinearities in the data and this is quite exciting because hopefully well not soon but you know in the next years we can actually go and measure these things so we can sort of see these nonlinearities in our gravitational waveforms. Now, what we also then decided to do is, okay, somehow let's go and look in this very strong field regime, right? Because there, it should have been very obvious to somehow get these quadratic modes, right? Because the strong field regime, um, there, you know, GR should be even more nonlinear, so to say, so we should find them. So what we did is we looked at the numerical simulation of the head-on collision of two black holes. And we did the same analysis as uh, the other people that did that at infinity with our gravitational waveforms. So we fitted the fundamental mode, the first overtone, and then again, we let the data decide. And as you can see here, again, if we look at the mismatch, this is what the data seems to prefer. So it really seems to prefer, again, another quadratic mode. But to, so that's nice. But to our surprise, it was very difficult to actually find these quadratic modes. And why was that? Well, right, these quadratic modes, uh, if you look at the frequencies, they're kind of, well, relatively easy to, to calculate. But if you look at the amplitude of the quadratic modes, it is quadratic in the amplitudes of the linear modes. So if you can imagine, right, if your amplitude of your linear mode is small, then, you know, the amplitude of the quadratic mode is going to be even smaller. So what we had to do is two things. Uh, we need to, we used to boost the black holes sort of to maximize the linear effect, right? If you somehow boost the black holes, you get more distortions of your horizon. And uh, we had to use very accurate numerical simulations to even find these modes in the first place. So this, I think is kind of surprising, but luckily, I mean, we were able to find it and we found that indeed this relation, uh, which in principle from theory, you should be able to calculate the alpha, but that's, uh, you know, how it scales. That's very painful and difficult to calculate, so we didn't, but we could fit it. 
And we found, in particular, this result. So this is the, the slope that um, we got. So this is kind of nice, and I think uh, this is exciting because this really shows us that GR is, is properly nonlinear, although not so nonlinear. You can still just use linear perturbation theory. You just have to go one order higher. But I think this is a very exciting because it also connects to uh, you know the next you know things that we can expect from uh, gravitational wave observations. Good. Uh, again, if you fell asleep, you can wake up again. Part three. <laughs> Um, and that has to do with this question, right, that I uh, also posed at the beginning again. So can we really distinguish black holes from other compact objects? And in particular, there's this very nice event, GW190814, where we measured, or we like, as a human species, not me, I was not involved in this analysis, uh, that we me or measured this 23 solar mass black hole and some other compact object of 2.6 solar masses that we don't really know what it is. So it could be a neutron star or it could be a black hole. And then of course that's interesting, like how do we actually distinguish, you know, these light, you know, these light black holes, so to say, or these heavy neutron stars, if you want, from each other? How do we do that? Well, I mean, obviously if we have an optical counterpart, we know the answer, then it has to be a neutron star, right? But of course, if you don't see an optical counterpart, it could be either because you know the objects are too far, so we can't see it with our telescopes, or even if it's nearby, right? It might be that the telescopes didn't point in the right direction, so you didn't see it. So if you don't see an optical counterpart, you need some other way of telling you uh, whether this object is a black hole or a neutron star. So then, we got into the business of these tidal love numbers, right? That I told you, they sort of measure how easy it is to deform uh, these objects. And it turns out that black holes, as I said, they have a love number of exactly zero. And neutron stars have a love number typically of, you know, say 100 to 1,000. So if you can measure, you know, some number that's different from zero, right, you know that's a neutron star. But it turns out that heavy neutron stars have much smaller love numbers. So of course, then it's gonna be a much more difficult, right? Uh, to distinguish a small number from zero than you know, a large number from zero. So that means that for these heavy neutron stars, actually we are not, or likely we will not be able to, to use these tidal love numbers to tell us whether these objects are uh, neutron stars or black holes. In particular, right, the best thing that we have so far is a measurement of new or this, these love numbers, um, you know, under different assumptions where you assume that the object is highly spinning or not. And the best that we can do today is, well, not say whether it's different from zero or not. We can only say you know, at this stage where it was less than 800, which I mean is already great, but you know, not so great if you want to say whether this object is a neutron star or a black hole, right? So what do we do in practice then for certain cases? Well, typically what we do is, well, if it's less than three solar masses, we call it a neutron star, which to some extent is reasonable, right? Because certainly above three solar masses, you cannot have neutron stars. We know that from, you know, theoretical considerations and observations. So, you know, that makes sense. If something's heavier than that, it should be a black hole. So. We, in fact, actually say that everything above five solar masses, we call that black holes. And that is nothing fundamental. It's just something that's sort of motivated from X-ray observations. Because we haven't seen any black holes with X-rays less than five solar masses. So we somehow say that, you know, there are no black holes with less than five solar masses. This is, of course, strange, right? Like, I mean, we also, well, there could be very likely primordial black holes. These will certainly have, um, have uh, uh, masses less than five solar masses. So it's weird, right? So we, in fact, like there are many reasons to expect that you have black holes less than this. Like I said, primordial black holes, but also if I have the merger of two light neutron stars, I can create a black hole. And that black hole will likely have a mass less than, uh, you know, five solar masses. Or if I have some delayed supernova explosion, then I can also create black holes less than that. So to me, it seems kind of strange that you know everything less than three solar masses we call a neutron star, but that's in practice how we've been sort of operating as a community. 
<laughs> now, luckily, I think there is another nice way that we can do, and that is the or tool that we can use, and that's use the spin-induced particle moment. So what's that? Right? If an object is spinning very rapidly, it will want to deform, right? It will not stay spherical, right? We know um, like the Kerr solution, right? It's not a spherical solution, right? It has a deformed horizon. So similarly for other objects, if they're spinning rapidly, they get some induced quadruple moment. And you know how much that object will be deformed depends on whether this object is a black hole or, or a neutron star again. So for instance, for a black hole, it turns out that um, this coefficient is exactly one. And for neutron stars, it's, it's larger. And the nice thing about this spin-induced quadruple moment is that, you know, have, or um, this this their spin will be the the spin of these heavy neutron stars, which are you know more difficult to distinguish from the, the light neutron stars because we cannot use those tidal love numbers, right? The spin of these heavy neutron stars is likely high, right, to support their higher mass. Uh, and we also expect actually light black holes to be spinning somewhat rapidly. So. This, you know, this is going to be large, hopefully, and thus, you know, this, this spin in your quadruple moment is going to be important. So how do we take this into account? Well, you know, the thing is, what we need to do is create some efficient waveforms <coughs> for spinning objects. And of course, we have some efficient waveforms for spinning objects, but unfortunately, we actually only have them for black hole binaries, where we, uh, you know, we always assume that this kappa thing is exactly one, but it's not. Right. So what we did is, well, we let kappa be different from one, right, and included this effect of the spin-induced quadruple moment. <coughs> of course, when you do that, you run into like some challenges. I'll not go into the detail, but it turns out that this system of all these these different like these nine different spins that you have, right, or nine different um, things that you need to take into account because you have three spins, right. The, three uh, for the spin of one black hole or, or neutron star, three for the other object. And then of course the orbital angular momentum. So you have like nine quantities that you in principle need to involve. Uh, luckily in these systems with black holes, you can you have lots of uh, conserved quantities. So in fact, in the end, it turns out that only one object, right? One of those you know, combinations, you really need to evolve dynamically. But if you let Kappa be different from one, Turns out that one of these other things that you know you thought was conserved is no longer conserved. So things become more complicated, but uh, we fixed it. Uh, I'll not go into the details, but what you then do is that you find a nice wafer model, and now you can compare the wafer models from these black holes with their neutron stars. And that's what you see here. Well, not quite the waveform. Here you see uh, two important angles for the waveform. Uh, so let's focus on this plot in particular where, well, quite ironically, the black hole case is in blue and the neutron star case is in black. Uh, later on, I realized I should have flipped those colors. It would have made more intuitive sense, but anyhow. Um, what you see here nicely that, well, for certain set of parameters, similar right to the gravitational wave events that we are interested in, if we have, you know, kappa being one or kappa being, you know, four, it matters, right? You see that, these, this angle really defases. And this is something that, that we can see with uh, future gravitational wave observations. In fact, uh, we, um, we, well, of course, this effect also depends on the angles of your, um, the different spins. So, of course, you have to be somewhat lucky that the, the, the way that the, the spins are, are aligned, they should be somehow close to alignment, but not quite exactly then this effect is maximized. So what we decided to do, and this is still a little bit preliminary, but we did a reanalysis of the, uh, this event GW1908-14 to see if we could tell whether that extra object was a neutral star or black hole. Unfortunately, uh, we couldn't. But <laughs> the good news is that, you know, with the new um, um, runs of LIGO and then, you know, future upgrades, we expect that this will allow us to really help distinguish these uh, um, sort of these cases where we have heavy neutron stars versus light black holes uh, with this effect. So let me um, conclude. I want to say that the future is bright, I think. Um, I think 
first of theoretical results are always incredibly useful, right? Before we spend lots of energy, time, making all, doing all kinds of data analysis, we should sure, make sure that our theoretical models are sound. And in particular, I think like thin shell models, we've shown that they're generically unstable. Of course, one could fix this because right in the models that I did, right, I assumed vacuum or up to a cosmological constant, but I consider that vacuum right on the inside and uh, storage shield on the outside, right? If one were to put other stuff on the inside, then, you know, of course, I, that depends on the details what you put on the inside. But generically, right, for many of these models, uh, we sort of have these vacuum models. So these thin shell models are, are I think, not so interesting um, because of their instabilities. And then uh, I think nonlinearities in general relativity are, well, hopefully soon uh, measurable. And I think that's, that's quite exciting. And I think it hopefully will also inform us exactly about what goes on at the horizons of black holes, right? Because I mean, it's fun to see gravitational waves, but they're really cool because it tells us about processes near the horizon, right? So uh, I think that is exciting. And oh, good. And the last thing what I want to say is that we now have developed a new tool that will help us distinguish, you know, whether uh, we have these uh, heavy neutron stars or, or light black holes through this, this spin-induced particle moment. Um, thank you for listening. So we have now some time for questions. I will begin by asking people in the room. So if anyone has a question, and then I will Rene, let Rene moderate the questions in the Zoom session. Thank you so much. That was a very interesting talk. Um, I wonder. I wonder. Yeah. Again, like uh, in, if, um, if for example, if, if you had like these compact objects, right, or, or black holes, whatever you want to call them, and they're imagine that they were formed. There's some mechanism that prevents to get to those solutions that we know and love, right? Have so much symmetry, right? Matter that never quite collapses, yeah, yeah. but then forms apparent horizons that last for a long, long time. Yes. You would expect to see maybe something in those nonlinearities, no? To see what matter is made of, no? Uh, kind of. Yeah. Good. Good. So I. I uh, so it's a question. So I know. No, no, no. I, I certainly think so. So. Um, yeah. No. I, I think these nonlinearities will be very helpful, in particular, really to nail down uh, exactly these more like things that really mimic black holes better and better, so to say, right? Because. Um, Ultimately, from the data, right, you do you measure a, a waveform, but in the end, right, you can only measure still limited things. So the more ways we really have to get like these inconsistency checks, and in particular, right, something like nonlinearities, I think is a very strong consistency check. So I think this is really exciting new uh, new new things that that, that we could. So numerical relativity, of course, what people do is they actually do things fully. Uh, non-linearly, right? So, but then of course, often the question is, okay, well, what do you do? Uh, well, you know, on your computer, what do you measure and how do you interpret things? And in particular, um, for this this data analysis for that last part, for the merger thing, is is really typically only done typically using linear perturbation theory until, you know, uh, two, two, two years ago. Uh, hi. I was just wondering about the um, uh, calculations you did with those uh, quasi-normal modes. Yeah. So you mentioned that uh, you had to uncover the frequencies only in the second order perturbation theory. Yeah. I was just wondering uh, what kind of masses you used for this study and whether if you go to smaller masses where gravity is stronger on the event horizon, you will see uh, that even second order perturbation theory breaks down. Ah, great. Uh, so in these cases, good. So. Um, to get the frequencies of the, um, the second order perturbation theory, you don't need to assume anything on the masses. So you can keep them, or, or of, in fact, right, you only have a single mass because you're still doing perturbation theory of uh, a curved black hole, right? So you just have one mass. And then, you know, you could, in effect, all these frequencies just keep on scaling just with the mass. Uh, so, in fact, the answer for the frequencies is mass independent. Then of course, when you go find or look for the effect in your numerical simulations, things do depend on uh, uh, the masses. Uh, and in this case, we use, well, in ADM units, masses similar or around one. Uh, we have, that's just 
currently, I, I, I don't expect, it's good. So I don't expect this to be important. Um, uh, let's see, good. Uh, uh, maybe At least the frequencies don't change. Let, let me just tell you that. Thanks, yeah. thanks. Thank you. So any more questions? No. So if there are no more questions, René, are there any questions on the Zoom session? Hi, Gerardo. No question in the Zoom, not neither in the YouTube. Okay. <laughs> then we so can... So advanced here. <laughs> so we can thank again the speaker for this wonderful talk. So we'll we'll be back at uh, ten past three for the discussion 